Um, as you all know, let's see, we're going to be talking about dementia today, and we have our panel of experts that are here to, sp to speak to you. I will introduce them as they come up, but we're going to start with this video that was produced by the Alzheimer's Society. It's on YouTube, and we really love this video because it shows how we can make a small change in our behavior and our interaction with somebody who has dementia, and it will really make a big difference in their life. So let's go ahead and start with the video. Um, what? Should I, I forgotten? Um, should I? Just, just go sit down. Just oh. go sit down. Yeah. Right. Chicken cheese. What? Chicken cheese. Um, sorry. Chick oh. People with dementia have experiences like this every day. A little bit of understanding, tolerance and patience can make all the difference. I'll, I'll tell you what, if you go into the seats just there, right. when we get there, I'll call you, okay? It's okay, madam. I can't, I can't get on. Let me help you. This way. Thank you. Can I have a look at that list? Yes. Chicken and cheese. Oh. Let's go this way. Thank you. Find out how to become dementia friendly. Contact Alzheimer's Society today. Okay, so as you can see, this video is not specifically about first responders, but we think it demonstrates very well the kind of situations that somebody with dementia might find themselves in and how they really just need that extra little bit of help to guide them through. So our first presenter here today is Elizabeth Newbig. She is, I don't have her title in front of me, but she is a geriatrician in our community and um, very well respected, has a very high reputation. I know lots of people who are really always hoping that um, Betsy will be their geriatrician. So we're so excited to have her today and she's going to be giving us um, a lot of medical information about dementia. So let's welcome Betsy. There you go. Do you have the clicker? I think I do. Do yeah. I just press, just push this next okay. button? Okay, yeah. Hi everybody. Hello? Hello. Okay. 
So I'm actually an internist, and geriatrics is a specialty within internal medicine or family practice, and it was a brand new specialty when I uh, graduated. Um, so I'm actually just an internist, not a geriatrician, but that's okay. Um, so I wrote these objectives to try to sound kind of non-medical, just for fun. Um, and so we're going to be discussing stereotypes, discussing lookalikes, discussing falls, discussing football, and discussing assumptions. So one of my patients uh, was out, and she was walking through one of the local colleges. And she, she's a good walker. She's walking right along. And the security guards see her, and uh, she looks a little elderly. And so they started calling to her because they were afraid she was lost. And uh, they were yelling, and she wasn't responding, and she kept walking. And uh, they were finally able to catch up to her. And you know, she looked at them brightly, but really wasn't answering their questions. And so they called the police. So there can be very slight differences between somebody with mild dementia and a normal person. And so you want to look at their facial expression, their attire, their gait, and their actions. And she really was, you know, she was walking well, walking with purpose. She was dressed appropriately. And, um, you know, so they were making a stereotype of an older person thinking they would be lost. Well, wandering does occur in dementia. 60% of people can be wanderers. So it's, it's not an unreasonable assumption. And if a dement, uh, person with dementia does get lost uh, 24 hours, they're in serious trouble. So my son's favorite, you know, <laughs> the hobbit and all. So anyway, what do you think about this lady? Does she have dementia? It's, no, just here. It's possible, but it turned out she's just extremely hard of hearing. She's so hard of hearing that hearing aids don't work for her, and she needs a, um, a special device. So the thing is, she is over age 85, and about 50% of people over age 85 had dementia. So stereotyping can help you. You can be half right. But the thing is, the way you respond to her, if you respond um, you know, just slowly and carefully, I think she could have answered the questions. Um, you know, she does a little lip reading and things. And that's how you'd want to respond to a, a person with dementia as well. Okay, so with a diagnosis of dementia, it's a diagnosis over time. So it's usually a gradual process unless it's vascular dementia. And you'd want to have a caregiver, somebody who knows the person well, who can describe their behavioral and cognitive changes that have happened. Uh, so you may not have that as a first responder coming onto the scene. You may not know what their history is. Um, so you'd want to do a full physical exam, a neurologic exam. and. I think most of you are familiar with the mini mental status exam. My son was a first responder and he said he thought you guys would be aware of that. And if you score less than 24, um, that's often a sign the person has dementia or delirium. And then there's, the doctor can prescribe neuropsychological testing where they go into more depth. Then we often scream for uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, but the fact is the studies show that even replacing B12 if it's low often doesn't fix the memory problem. But hypothyroidism is very treatable and can fix a memory problem that's due to hypothyroidism. Uh, depression often is called pseudo-dementia because they can have trouble with memory. So we, we look into that. The genetic testing is not usually performed. Uh, it's not recommended as a screening test. 
Um, but we often do do an MRI or a CT with first diagnosis. I think the main thing for you guys is you don't want to assume that somebody's memory problem is dementia. Even if they have dementia, you want to listen to the caregivers uh, because they can tell you, oh, there's been a change in this person. You want to talk to the person first and give them time to answer. It can take somebody with dementia 10 seconds to come up with a response. So you, you really have to sit there and count to yourself because you'd be surprised how quick you expect a response and you won't often get it. You want to give them one-step instructions. You want to tell them what you're doing. Even show them the instruments you're using, like if you're doing a pulse ox or something. If you have time, have them do it on you first, you know, so they just understand what's happening. Uh, you want to document what you're seeing from that person because that's going to really help the, the doctor in the emergency room because their mentation may change over the time from you seeing them to them seeing them. It may get better or it may get severely worse. Um, like I said, you want to talk to the caregiver. You want to know if there's a diagnosis of dementia and when their mental status changed. So the question is, is this dementia? Uh, they look befuddled. They're slower to answer. They're easily distracted. They're walking the wrong way. They're making disjointed statements. Uh, they're stumbling. They're crying, you know, but they've had a period of unconsciousness. Well, the, these were symptoms listed for, can anybody guess? Concussion. So falls are a leading cause of traumatic brain injury, and over the age of 75, uh, they're the highest rate. Uh, over 75, they have the highest rates of uh, brain injury due to falls. And dementia is an independent risk factor for falls. Uh, and people with dementia recover less well. So this is just showing that a moderate uh, traumatic brain injury has a 2.3 times risk of developing uh, Alzheimer's disease. So. You know, it goes both ways. They have an increased risk of falling, and the falls with traumatic brain injury can cause memory loss. And then you've all heard in the news about football being of great concern for mild traumatic brain injuries. And they're showing that with these mild traumatic brain injuries over time, they can have similar brain pathology to Alzheimer's disease with the beta amyloid and the tau plaques. So this is just talking about how they're trying to figure this out, whether they're going to make new rules in football, whether they're going to be able to fix the helmets, and this suggests that just fixing the helmet doesn't fix the problem. So what about these symptoms? Uh, they have an acute or subacute presentation of change in their uh, memory. It's a fluctuating course. Sometimes they can talk to you a little bit, then other times they're more clouded. Uh, they have poor concentration. They have trouble with their short-term memory. They're sleeping during the day. They have hallucinations. Uh, they're agitated. They have an unsteady gait. What do you think this is? Any ideas? This is delirium. And delirium occurs in 15 to 20% of all hospital admissions. And it has a higher rate in the elderly. And dementia patients are at even more increased risk. And it's often underdiagnosed and poorly managed. And as you can see here, it increases with age. So there's an overlap there again with dementia being more common over age 85 and delirium being more common. So you don't want to assume that it's just dementia. 
So these patients are very vulnerable. They can wander. They can get lost. Um, like I said, it's common to miss the diagnosis. It can become very serious. And um, you don't want to assume that it's dementia or even in a person with mental challenges. Um, you don't want to assume that it's just that. In fact, I had a patient when I was a resident who came in from a home. He was young, in his 20s, and it was hard to know what his, his abilities were previous, and he wasn't really talking to us. Turned out he had meningitis. So um, he didn't get the spinal tap right away because we were thinking that he just had other things going on. Um, so you always want to do a full exam. You want to check their airway, breathing, circulation, and vital signs. And the patient may not be cooperative. Uh, you want to make sure you check their blood glucose and oximetry. Uh, there are multiple conditions that can cause delirium. You've heard of the urinary tract infections that cause it. But also, a low sodium is very common in the elderly, can happen with uh, lots of medications, including uh, antidepressants. Um, hypoglycemia, you've probably seen that in your work. They really act very crazy. So lots of medications that can cause it in the elderly, even Lasix, um, even statins have been shown to cause it. So at the scene, you definitely want to look for bottles and medications, because um, alcohol could contribute to their memory problems and how they're acting. But it, it could be delirium looking like alcohol problems. And uh, thiamine supplementation is, is very important in people who have alcohol problems. Okay, so the differential diagnosis of delirium is dementia, depression, and bipolar, as well as schizophrenia. And sundowning and delirium have to be differentiated. Sundowning is when a person with dementia every evening kind of acts the same. They, um, they're more confused. And it, their pattern is usually very similar each day it happens. Whereas with delirium, it's a change in their sundowning pattern. So this is a case of a, a person who comes in looking like a stroke. They have right-sided weakness. They have a Babinski on the right. Um, otherwise, they're healthy. So you know, you've know, you heard time is brain. You've got to get them to the ER. But of course, you're going to check his O2 and his glucose while he's on the way to the hospital. And it turned out that this person had a very low glucose, and it was due to his alcohol use and how alcohol affects the, the management of blood glucose. In, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. OK, so this was um, just a low glucose. So, and this kind of explains it, that he had focal findings that totally resolved with uh, fixing the hypoglycemia. So the, the main thing is you want to look carefully at the situation and document what you see. Um, you want to recognize that you're stereotyping, but it can be helpful because if they're over age 85, Half the time they may have trouble with dementia. You've got to take the time to ask them questions and still focus on them, not just assume that they can't answer. Um, you want to stay outwardly calm and give them time to answer. Um, and don't assume that the current situation is due to dementia. Really listen to the caregivers. That's one thing the nurses told me at the nursing homes. Tell them to listen to us because they'll come in and the patient's been telling us they have chest pain and you guys get there and the patient says,
do I have chest pain? <laughs> and so they did at one point, but they don't remember that they did. So um, anyway, remember there are lots of uh, diagnoses that overlap with dementia, and you want to assume that it's delirium if they've had a change. Any questions? Thank you, Betsy. Keep in mind that at the um, towards the second half of our time today, we are going to be doing some role plays and some question and answer. So if you do have questions, you can just write them down. We'll have plenty of time for them later. So our next speaker is Joy Spahn. Joy is with the Alzheimer's Association here in Western Michigan, and we are so glad that she can present to us today. They do a lot of work with caregivers and with people with their dementia, so she is really one of the experts on um, speaking to people with dementia. So, Joy. I think I need a few more things in my hands here. Hi. <laughs> Wow, you sound like you really got your work cut out for you. Not only do you have to deal with folks that are that are having some medical issues going on, now we have to now you have to think about whether or not they're cognitively able to understand what you're asking of them. But I'm so glad that you're here. Before I start, I want to um, just kind of draw your attention to some things in your in your folder because I'm not going to go over them specifically during the presentation, but I think they're really good reference things for you. And there's actually a one-sheeter, looks like this, that is kind of a lot of the things that um, Betsy was talking about and some of the things that I'm going to be talking about too, but it gives you kind of like a one-shot one shot deal looking at these. So um, we used to have little cards, but they kind of changed the format for this. But a lot of times folks would take these and just put them in their visor or put them um, somewhere in their in their vehicle so that it's a, a quick reminder. Because we all know that when things are, are hot and under pressure that sometimes um, you don't remember all that kind of stuff. The other thing that's in here is a brochure called The Basics of Alzheimer's. <clears throat> And again, it covers some of the things that, that Betsy was talking about, but it, it goes into a little bit more detail about some of the, the signs and the symptoms. Uh, it talks a little bit about how these changes affect the brain. It talks a little bit about um, how to find out if a person has clinically has, has a dementia and some other things. So this is kind of a good little reference for you too. So, and there's other really good stuff in your handout, but I just wanted to bring your attention to that real quickly. Any questions on any of that material so far? Okay. I am so glad you asked that question because we are going to talk about that. There you go. I knew it. See, I paid him. All righty. These are just a couple things that we're going to be going over today. Um, kind of an overview of dementia to address the question that you had. Some communication tips and strategies, and that's going to kind of build on what you've already heard from Betsy. And then I'm going to talk just briefly about a program that the Alzheimer's Association offers called Medic Alert Safe Return, because this is something for a couple of reasons that's, that are important that I'll, I'll go into when we get there. So, sometimes when I do these presentations, I deliberately throw that question out into the audience because I kind of like to see what people have to say. Because frequently I'll get things like, well, you know, my person really doesn't have Alzheimer's disease, they have dementia because that's worse, you know. Or, no, my person has dementia because, because Alzheimer's is worse. So, one of the things that I ask them is, how can you tell the difference? Anybody want to try it? Because the answer's right here. Okay. Actually, dementia is an umbrella term. It describes a group of symptoms. <coughs> Excuse me. So things like changes in memory, most noticeably short-term memory, 
It'll include things like behavior and mood and all those sorts of things. And a lot of times when I talk to folks about dementia, I say, you know, because we always think of it kind of more linear. We think of it just as the forgetfulness part. And frequently when we, when we think of someone with dementia, we think about them way down here at the end of the disease where they're fairly impaired, they're requiring a lot of assistance, um, sometimes conversations can be a little challenging, those kinds of things. But you got to start somewhere. And so I always tell folks there's a lot of living that has to take place between the time a person, a person starts um, noticing some of these symptoms and when they get down to this point where they, <coughs> excuse me, require a lot of assistance. So I often say, think of it more like a spider web. Because with a spider web, you have lots of different parts that are all connected. So you have things like memory, short-term memory. You have things like mood. You have things like judgment, impulse control, all of those kinds of things that make up who we are. Because every single thing that we do is based on memory. We come into this world with a little bit of a blank slate. And then as we get older, we learn things like <clears throat> how to make good decisions, how to be independent, how to drive, how to act in certain circumstances so we don't act the same when we're going out partying with our friends as we do when we go to church, or at least that's frowned upon. <laughs> so, so we learn all of those things from the time that we're born. But we don't often think about that as learned behavior, but it is. So... <clears throat> So Alzheimer's disease is actually one cause of dementia. There are multiple causes of dementia, but it's generally hallmarked by a loss of memory and other kind of intellectual abilities. So when I'm talking about that spider web, those intellectual abilities are the things that come into play as well. And they progress enough where there's changes enough where it actually interferes with your ability to continue and perform day-to-day -day kinds of things. But again, keep in mind that this is a progressive kind of thing. So sometimes what you might find um, when you're responding to a call is someone that might be in the earlier stages of the disease. And so they're going to act very differently than someone that's in the later stages. And it's often difficult to be able to recognize that because generally you're called out for a trauma. So there could be something like a head trauma or some other kind of an injury, which again is going to have a, a, a challenging impact on a person's cognitive abilities. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. It covers about 70% of, the, of the, the causes of dementia that are out there. Feel free to ask any questions at any time, by the way. Sorry. One of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about too is younger onset. Oftentimes when we think about dementia, we think about, we think about someone that's older. But there are actually a, a small percentage of folks that develop the disease in an earlier stage. And when we call it younger onset, it's generally somebody that's developed signs and symptoms of the disease before the age of 65. And it becomes complicated sometimes to diagnose that because we don't expect it from a perspective coming as a first responder, I would think. Because you kind of, we talked about the, we kind of talked about those stereotypes and how that can be to your advantage. But if you happen to have someone that's younger and they're exhibiting some of those signs of confusion, it's not likely that your mind is going to go right to maybe this person has a dementia. We've had folks that have come into our office. <clears throat> that have been in their late 50s. And that becomes a unique situation for that person because a lot of times they still have families and things like that at home, and that presents a whole different circumstance in terms of planning for lifetime events. Frontal temporal dementia is more common initially in, in younger folks than it is with some of um, older when it's diagnosed a little bit later. Um, and what happens with the frontal temporal dementia is you don't often see that initial forgetfulness that brings attention to it a lot of the times. What you'll see is more behavioral issues. So uh, lapses in judgment control or challenges in judgment and impulse control and things like that. Do I have a timer? Are you going to be my timer? Okay. <laughs> 
I always tell folks it's not the talking part, it's the shutting up part. So <laughs> one of the things that I wanted to bring your attention as we start to talk a little bit more about, about some of these things, and I don't know where the pointer is on this here. Notice this cross-section of the brain. And we're going to be talking about language and, and memory and how the brain um, functions in those areas. And you'll notice that this is a normal kind of brain. Notice the size and the shape of how these areas of the brain that help control those parts of our, of our cognition compared to this over here. And I always tell folks that sometimes um, one of the things that can be your best advantage of working with someone with dementia is changing your expectations of that person. Because when you've got some impaired ab abilities and your expectations remain the same, often there's, there's some challenges there in, in meeting those needs. So these are the four areas of cognition that we're going to talk briefly over the next 15 minutes on. <laughs> we're going to talk about recent memory, language, visual spatial functioning, and executive functioning. So recent memory. This includes a loss of recent or short-term memory. There's a difference between forgetting something and being able to retrace your steps and forgetting that something occurred. Most of us have probably walked into a room someplace, set something down, and then you got busy doing something else and you're like, what did I do that? Ever happened to you? Some people are going, other people are going, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty common. I frequently get asked, I keep, you know, I keep losing my keys. Does that mean I have dementia? And I usually say, no, it just means you're really not very good with your keys. But if you forget what that goes to, or you start finding your keys in really unusual places or different places than what you would expect, then it might be something to start looking at how things are, are progressing in general. Unable to rely on memory to prompt or orient the person as appropriate to the, and appropriately act or respond. What this is important to is as you're, um, as you're responding to situations and understanding how these things are going to play out um, as, these, as you're trying to interact and get questions answered from some of these folks. Um, because what happens is as the, as the short-term memory becomes impaired, it makes it difficult for people to respond sometimes if you're relying on short-term memory. So we want to take a look at that. <coughs> to help you um, be able to ask questions that are appropriate. Sometimes when you get someone and you're asking them a question, they may wind up, their answer may sometimes come across as conflated or inappropriate. What happens with memory as it progresses um, with an impairment is sometimes the past and the present become mixed. If you've been around someone that has a cognitive impairment, sometimes they'll mistake um, a person for another person, like a, um, a, a spouse, or excuse me, a, a, a child for a spouse or something like that. And that's because as, as, as the memory becomes more and more challenged and impaired, those memories have a tendency to merge. So when you're asking someone questions, it's important to be aware of that. And then, although people, places, and routines may feel familiar to the individual, everything is new, especially as the disease progresses. Just a quick question. Um, what are some of the things that, we're going, to reduce, we're going to be doing some role play later, but what are some of the things um, that you may have run into where you questioned a person's cognition, questioned their memory, or their, whether or not they had a dementia? I'm just curious, because we've got quite a group here. And that's a really, thank you, that's a really good example. Because what you're just talking about is a person's judgment that if you think about it um, in a little bit different way, it's not logical in that scenario, but like we talked about a few minutes ago, how you can take information and kind of just mix up the time and place. It makes sense that someone would put a hole in something that's not draining. It doesn't make sense in terms of how you put those pieces of information together that you would do that 
on a second floor or do that rather than looking at whether the, the drain was stopped up. So if you take those kinds of pieces of information and start to think how that might um, have been different had that person's been able to integrate that kind of information. So the person was trying to resolve a problem, resolve a situation, but they were doing it in a way that was not appropriate in conjunction with other kinds of things. Other kinds of things that you run into. Absolutely. Yeah. And is this the first time that they've had that kind of a of a situation? Okay. That's a delusion. Um, that the person believes something is happening. Sometimes information, the same kind of information can be misinterpreted so that a person believes that something is happening even though they can't see it or feel it. So it kind of goes back to, to um, some of the recent memory and being able to take that information and integrate it into what's going on and how the senses begin to misinterpret and perceive things differently. So your comments are about um, you know, moving slow, maintaining eye, con eye, eye contact and things like that becomes really important as we look at moving through how you interact and what you do with the person. What we're going to do here, and I, and I mentioned to fail this, we're going to go through these areas, but then at the end of here, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about ways of, of kind of hands-on practical approaches too. So language. One of the things that becomes difficult um, are folks having difficulty with being able to express better? Oh, oh my goodness. So being able expressive and receptive kinds of skills. So sometimes people wind up replacing words for other words. So you may ask someone something and they may give you an answer that is totally dis dis associated with what they're saying because they're having difficulty. The slide that was further back, I pointed out the changes in the brain and how that impacts um, a person's ability to respond. So if you've got some damage going on in an area of the brain, it's not going to be functioning as well as it does. And in order for us to do things, all parts of the brain have to work together. I mentioned that kind of spider web effect. All of those pieces interact with each other. And as the brain changes and parts of the brain die because of the disease process that occurs with the different kinds of dementia, it interferes with the brain's ability to communicate across the different parts of the brain. So you may see things like um, if you ask uh, somebody a question, they may give you a, a kind of a stock answer. And that actually is one of the things that becomes very difficult um, in recognizing whether or not a person is cognitively alert enough. Because we all have those phrases like, oh yeah, sure, well, I didn't mean that, or you're absolutely right. So if you start getting a lot of those kinds of responses as opposed to detailed kind of responses, then it's something to take a look at. Some of the visual spatial things. Um, <clears throat> this becomes really important when people are trying to navigate within their environment. Because what will happen is that as the brain changes, it interprets um, spatial information differently. So that has to do with both how the vision changes, but also how the brain interprets what's going on. So a person might not be able to see very well or see as well because it impacts peripheral vision, it impacts all of those kinds of things that help us collect information to keep ourselves oriented and to keep on track. So. So if a person is having driving violations or a person's wandering away or whatever, a lot of times a person can actually read signage, verbally read it, but that doesn't mean that they're understanding what they're reading or what they're seeing. So there's two different things going on. One is being able to interpret that information. The other one is actual changes that occur with, um, in, in seeing things. I mentioned the executive functioning. Um, there's a, the when I talked a little bit about the frontal temporal dementia, but the other kinds of things that happen is that's the part of the brain or that's the part of our cognition that helps us keep things in track. It helps us organize. It helps us know how to sequence things. It helps us pay attention and stay on task. 
it helps us be able to have abstract thoughts, which means um, conceptualizing things as opposed, as, as opposed to very concrete kinds of things. So someone that begins to have difficulty in these areas uh, will, will need a little bit more time to respond to things, like you mentioned in terms of, of maintaining that contact with, with the person in terms of visual contact, but also keep taking your time. Needing, the person needs time to respond because their brain's not processing information as quickly as it would if it were, in, if, um, it were intact. These are some things that can impact a person's orientation and their ability to interpret and respond to their environment. So if it's unfamiliar, if it's the area is unfamiliar, um, if there is changes in uh, sensory perception around the person, their difficulty to kind of comprehend or see the big picture, see what's going on and understand that globally, how they're, um, what's, how they're being impacted. And then also how this might impact their ability to make decisions. So you might see somebody um, <laughs> drilling holes in the bathtub. <laughs> so these are some things to look for if you suspect that a person has, um, has dementia. <clears throat> their age. Not, on, not just older folks um, wind up having difficulty with their cognition, but it certainly is, is um, more common in older folks. Looking at a person's facial expression, that eye contact is crucial. Be careful sometimes about touching someone if they're not interested in being touching because that, be, whether it's a shoulder or whatever, if you're going to do that, try and stay more neutral parts so that the person doesn't feel like you're ganging up on them. Look for things like, um, are they dressed appropriately? How are they walking? Does their gait seem to be, to be in line with what you would expect? Are their balance a little bit off? Certainly looking for how they're responding to a situation, if that's something that would be, that would be considered appropriate or not. And language, looking at how they're using words and how they're understanding what you're saying to them and if they're able to comprehend. Give a person time to respond. What's also helpful is if you're asking someone a question and you suspect that they may have some kind of cognitive impairment, after you've given them a few, a few seconds to respond, ask the same question and try using the exact same words rather than trying to rephrase it. Because one of the things that we have difficulty with um, is we always, we, 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 t we seem to think that if we can use just the right words and in just the right order that we can help someone understand. And that works against you with someone with, with dementia because the parts of the brain that help a person with logic and understanding and reasoning are the parts of the brain that become impaired. So that's why that doesn't work. Um, these are some other signs of agitation. Clenched fish, red, red face, pacing. Hand. These are all nonverbal kinds of things to be aware of that the person may not be able to um, respond to situations or respond differently than what you would expect. These are some quick communication tips. Make sure that you identify yourself and explain why you're there without going into tons of words. Make sure that they understand who you are. The good eye contact. Speak slowly. Be careful not to speak too loudly unless you think the person has, a, has some type of a hearing impairment because that can come across as being aggressive. And use short, simple sentences. It's helpful if you can ask yes and no questions. Um, ask them one at a time and make sure folks have enough time to, res to respond. Repeat the question exactly the way that you repeated it at least three times is generally a rule of thumb. If words aren't working, try some nonverbal kinds of things. Try and avoid confrontation because if you get into conflict, it doesn't often end well. <laughs> if possible, um, and, and if, it's, if you're trying to communicate or you're trying to whatever you're trying to do and the person's not responding, if you have another person, tag team with them. It's helpful if you can only have one thing going on at a time because too much stuff going on. I think back at the video and the lady walking into the, um, into the bank and into the grocery store, it just seemed like everything was, was ganging up on her, so to speak, because there was too much stuff for her to have to, to, have to sort out. And that can be a problem for someone with, with dementia. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about Medic Alert in a second. Be attentive to the moods and the emotion. Also pain, and I know that's probably why you folks get called in most of the time is because somebody's been hurt and they're in pain. And that certainly can be a challenge to folks that are not cognitively impaired, but someone that is impaired and has a difficult time expressing themselves and understanding what's going on, it becomes more complicated. Because I've worked with folks before that you know that they're in pain and you'll say, are you in pain? And they'll say, no. But then when you go up and you touch them where you think that they're going to hurt, and you'll say, does that hurt? And they'll say, yes. So again, the words sometimes lose their meaning. So you, ref you, you begin to rely on, on things like touch or cueing or different ways of asking that question, but understanding that cognitively they, they may not be able to answer that because of the language and, that, and the interpretive skills that are changing. Again, this is just kind of a reiteration about some of the things that we talked a little bit about. It's helpful if you can minimize distractions. If you really have someone that appears to be quite upset and is having a difficult time working with you, try and minimize those distractions. Get them in a place or have people walk away for a while so that you can, you can have that person's attention specifically on you. This is a picture of the Medic Alert. These are some things that the Medic Alert Safe Return, it's very low tech. And the reason that this is so excited right now, even with the Medic Alert Safe Return, people are found four times faster than those without it. Um, we always have the caregiver wear these as well. Um, if they will. And the exciting thing is we're able to offer this for free right now, and that's the reason that I have this slide up here. And we have those available. So if you are working with someone, if you've been called out because someone's wandered away or you've been called out and you think that, that the person could benefit from that, please call us. This is just time limited. And we've had a number of people that have registered, but the more we can get these on folks, the better, because it, it, it does help find folks. And this is our contact information. And I just went right through that, and I know I probably went over, and I apologize. <laughs> but do you have any quick questions for me? Just a quick comment. I yes. Over time, may I, sir? The, that, that make contact thing. Hi, my name is Don. I'm a paramedic. I'm here to help you. Is there, is there anything that I can help you with here today? I've made that contact in a non-threatening way. People are pretty used to shaking hands on an introduction. Um, and then I might even go into, if I check your pulse while we're Perfect. Here, The other thing that I liked about what you were saying is you took it really slow because those kinds of things that we were talking about, if a person has a difficult time comprehending stuff and you're there because there's an emergency of some sort and so you're a new person that's been introduced to this to this situation. So if a person's upset and all of a sudden you have new people coming in and you know carrying things and trucks flashing and all this other kind of thing, that's gonna make a person a little bit more nervous too. So anything that you can do, which I know you're all trained to do, in terms of trying to de-escalate something is going to be helpful, particularly to somebody with dementia. But you're absolutely right. Identifying yourself, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Don, I'm here to help you. And then just kind of take a breath and let people adjust to that so that you're not moving so fast. That's perfect. You want to teach this class? <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Well, and, and you have a, a, an excellent point, because not only do folks sometimes not recognize the pain, because the words change. So if you ask somebody, like I said, if you're in pain, they'll say no. But if you, if you touch them or if you know their history, like what you do, so that's a wonderful asset for your dad, to know, for, for you to be able to share that with his caregivers, is that, yes, that, that person does have pain, because it is unlikely that they're going to go and ask for that. So as you're responding to folks in, you know, home situations, be aware of that. I know very few older folks that, you know, as they've gotten older, that they haven't gotten some kind of chronic pain as well. And whether it's arthritis or injuries or something where um, a person can 
can experience a lot of pain and that actually can be one of the triggers for folks to respond um, more assertively or to be more frustrated and agitated is if there if there is some chronic pain involved and it hasn't been treated so anybody else yes Perfect. That's great. Good job. Thank you for sharing that. I want you to come to see me if I something happens. So <laughs> you guys are great. Any other comments or questions? Well, I think we're moving into the role play section. Yeah. Okay. Open it up to the rest of our speakers if they want to come up here and um, keep the questions coming. So the, the rest of the, our time here is going to be more informal and interactive. We have Chris Simons from Clark Retirement Community. Yep. She's going to be leading our role play. She has graciously volunteered to act as a friend for dementia. She does not have dementia. Not yet. Have, but not she, yet. Uh, she plays one very, very well. She has a lot of experience. And we are also adding Suzanne Oglin Hand um, from Pine Rest Christian Mental Health. We're very glad to have her here because she has a lot of clinical experience with people with dementia and their caregivers. So she has excellent things to share with us as well. So I'm going to open up to Chris. How we're going to do this is she's going to do a role play with one of you all, lovely volunteers. Um, we're going to see what, how that happens in an, an actual interaction. Then we're going to open it up to our panelists to see if what suggestions or advice they would have in that situation. And then we're going to open it up to the rest of you with comments or questions on that situation. So you can see on the agenda we have three different scenarios. We're going to go through them one by one um, and talk about how this might happen in a real-life situation. I will ask that if you have a comment or a question, if you could just wait for me to come to you with the microphone. They're going to have to use the microphone. I know. We'll have to. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I can take it over to him as I'm doing Okay, it. well, yeah. one, one of us so will bring you a microphone, just so that everybody can hear and so that the recording picks up as well. So we'll, we'll do our best with that. But um. So the person that is going to help me will have the microphone? Yes. Okay, all right. Okay, I need a volunteer. It will be painless. Oh, boy. Are you all going to be shy? Ah, here's one right there. He's ready. <laughs> <laughs> you will say that when you're done with me, yes. <laughs> no, no, you need to come over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have worn that yellow shirt. I'm going to set the stage a little bit to begin with. You mind if I sit down while you do that? You can sit, yeah. Um, my name's Arlene, and I am lost. I have walked about six blocks. Um, as I was walking, a jogger passed by me and decided to call 911. I'm short of breath and limping, and that's where uh, you can come up to me. And I'm also, I'm also carrying something that has uh, an address on it and a phone number. Okay, really? I can't see which leg I'm going to be limping on. <laughs> I'm Larry. I'm here to help you. Is there anything that I can... Go north, north, north. Okay. Do you want to get to the store? Let's see if we can get there. North. North? Something? You want to go north? Don't worry. I'm Larry. I'm here to help you. Can you talk to me a second? Can you talk to me North. A I go north. North. Okay. North. Now? You want to go now? North? Okay. That's south. You got to go back this way. I'll tell you what. Is that where you want to go? I can get you there. 5950 okay. oh, Lazy Deer Lane. Gotcha. Do you have a purse or anything with you? Oh, God, I lost it. You are? You lost your purse. I lost it. I lost it. Come over here and sit down a minute. And we'll I, I have to go. Do you? I have to go. Why don't we try and sit down and see if we can figure this out and I can get you there. I can get you there. Uh, oh. Yes. You want to call them? You want me to call them? That's my mother's number. I'll call her. Come on, let's. She's looking for me. I gotta, I gotta go up north. All right. North. 
I'm North. I'll get, I'll get you there. You Have don't the know her. You can't call her. I got the number. I can help you with it. Why don't you sit down? She's 99 years old. Why don't you sit down a minute and we'll talk about it? Because you're short of breath. You're, running, you're really working hard here. I, I am really late. I don't care what you have to say. Really? North. All right. I got to go north. How far north? Because you've gone about as what far as What difference does go. it make to you? Well, we've got to get you some help. <laughs> so, Arlene, why don't we do this? I don't me? know you. I know. And you got that funny outfit on. I do. That's pretty funny, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. All right. Well, and I'm going to be late. Well, let's get this. Let me call a minute and see if we can get it taken care of. Why don't you sit down a minute and we can talk about it. I have to sit, sit on the curb? Well, here, I'll bring in this nice chair for you. We live in a nice day. If you're from Clark, you got a nice, you got nice stuff over there. Mm -hmm. So... so. <laughs> Listen, why don't I give her a call? You do don't it. know me. I know I don't. You don't know me either. And I need to get going. And I'm going to get you going. Well, let me so go I then. somebody coming to help you right now. I don't need someone to help me. Oh. I'm 88 years old, and I can that's take it. care of myself. Really? What do you mean, that's, that's it? Do I look <laughs> older than that? Chris, you're doing real well. <laughs> I'm talking yeah. to you. So, how are we doing here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> yes. Ironically, you know what my wife's name is? Arlene. Arlene. <laughs> okay. 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 Chris, did you want to wrap up anything with that? Oh, I know. Let's make some comments. Anybody have a comment or question? What was done well? Yeah. Excellent answer. Okay. Have, have you ever had a situation where the person just keeps walking and you're supposed to help take care of them? And, and what has been the... Yeah, you okay, the yeah. Uh, we had an elderly gentleman wander away from our assisted care living facility. He was going to be placed there, and he knew he was going to be placed there, so he was walking down the sidewalk while the relative was trying to get him back in the car. Mm -hmm. And we drove him back there, and we had uh, kept the confidence with him. We went home, and eventually he was placed there. Mm -hmm. But I just continue to walk with him. Sometimes uh, we've had a gentleman a couple times. Uh, the last time he was actually had gone out to the doctor's office with a granddaughter, and she called saying that that he he wants to go somewhere. And when she got him back to the facility, he took off on her on foot and he just kept going and going so we tried different people walking with him and we finally found uh, his caregiver that worked really well but he would tend to bolt out into the road as you were walking out into traffic so uh, and sometimes that happens so uh, what about the approach that was used Mm-hmm. You know, scene safety is a big deal for all of us. So, you know, wherever she was trying to go, I'm a football coach. I don't think I need this, do I? <laughs> <laughs> so that we would get, we would keep her in a safe area at that point. Once you engage her, what do you, you're going to just, you wouldn't want to keep letting her go into a bad situation. So try and stay with her like the uh, young police officer over there said. Once you engage that, like, you really got to, now you're kind of committed. Mm -hmm. And either I call for Chief back here or somebody else, or get get some extra help because that that was tough business there, Chris. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes that's how it is. They just keep on going, and but I think using the calm voice was really helpful mm -hmm. in making that eye contact too, because I eventually sort of uh, decided that you were somewhat okay. Yes. Yes. Somewhat. You you, yeah. didn't I? Yes, you did. <laughs> Okay. I think another part of it too is that you have to be persistent and you made that point with you have to find that trigger that will help you communicate with that person mm -hmm. because everybody is different um, she may be more violent or she may be more calm and you have to find that trigger that you, you 
open up that communication pathway between mm -hmm. the two of you. And like you said earlier, that it may be a different person, uh, maybe take turns trying to, to connect with that person. And I think that's part of being persistent, persistent in finding that trigger that was going to mm -hmm. make you communicate better. And it's important that you don't have a lot of people, and you mentioned that, surrounding them. I, I own an adult foster care home, and one of our residents uh, sort of had some issues with uh, trying to strike other people and that sort of thing. And it, it was quite a while ago, uh, but three uh, people came, and they all had yellow um, rain jackets on and scared the heck out of her. And she goes, where did these mustard seed people come from? Get out of here. <laughs> but it was the yellow, and they all had it on, and she was scared to death. So, For us, at some point, EMS and police get involved. I mean, we, we have to keep gathering resources to protect her. And that's, right. that's what, the only thing we can do with her at that point, right? The other thing that I like that you did is you really kind of matched her pace and a little bit of the intensity that she had going without escalating it so that you didn't try and, and calm her too fast because she obviously was, was intent on what she needed to do. Um, but matching that pace and matching that intensity sometimes um, can be extremely helpful in helping someone de-escalate. Mm -hmm. Okay, All right, let's go into the next one. Need another volunteer. It's not that bad. No, it's not. I won't be that hard on the next person. <laughs> no. Need another person to help. We're going to be here a long time. I know. That's what I usually say to my staff if they don't come up. <laughs> I think. Yeah, let's get a woman up here. Right. Come on up. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Bonnie. <laughs> okay. So first, your friends and all the people you don't know, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Now, um, this is the front door of my house, right here. So if you would just come over here. Uh, and this is going to be the stairwell right here. My husband has gone downstairs and he has fallen. He has a lifeline, so he's pressed the button, which that um, has contacted uh, help for him. So Am I the help? You, you are the help. You're coming to the door, but uh, don't come right in. Just I'll have to make sure you can come in. But so you're just going to knock on the door and do say. Do I have two patients or one? Well, that will be yours to find out. <laughs> Paul, Paul, where are you? Paul, Paul. Knock, knock. Oh, oh, jeez. Knock, knock, knock. Oh, jeez, oh, jeez. Paul, Paul. Knock, knock. Hello, anybody home? Oh. Hello. Oh. Knock, knock, knock. Hello. Who are you? Hi, I'm Bonnie. Fallen, fallen down there. Okay, okay. Can you show are me? Are you selling vacuum cleaners? Not today. I'm gonna block you out for a bit. <laughs> okay. Can I help you? Did someone fall? Yes. Can you show me? Show me where somebody fell, okay? Will you be nice? I will. My name's Bonnie, and I'm here to help. I'm scared. It's okay. I'm scared because he's down there all by himself. Oh my God, you, what am I going to okay. do? Okay. What am I going to do? Do you know him? Yes. Okay, well, let's Of course go I see. know him. I've been with him all this time. It's your husband? Well, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> but oh, he's down yes. there. He did fall. Well, I'm going to get some more help come because I can't. Well, do hurry, it all by myself. because his head's bleeding. Okay. And I'm scared. Okay. I'm really so scared. If I have equipment with me. I'll... I'm scared. I'm sorry, hon, but you'll be all right because I'm going to take care of him. I am not your hon, but I'm scared. Okay, I'll take I'm care of him. Hun. I'm here to help. I'm scared. Okay, it's okay. I'm going to sit okay. over here. It's okay. All right, so okay. I'll let her sit down and I'll treat the patient. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. Excellent job. Any reactions to that one? Has anybody seen this before? Don, do I see a yes? Can you tell us about it? Well, I was just, you know, and I'm not picking on you, 
but what she said, I'm not your hun. Um, do we still teach that in, the, in paramedic school? We don't call our patients honey, sweetie, dear, okay? At least not until we've established a pretty good rapport with them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of like get it from them as an okay to, uh, to be, be that familiar. And again, I'm not picking on you, but that kind of, we, we talk about trigger points. Um, and, and you might have been starting to get close and then you do that and it's disrespectful and back off and, and, and now you you know we have to start over mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah it is it's a for us it's a stressful situation that we have to manage uh, because we really do have two patients there uh, one is a trauma patient and one's a, a, a medical I guess you, you could say and, and you have to you have to take care of both of them and get more resources in to, to help you do that So in terms of what you did well, you did a really nice job going slowly with her. And, and, and just your pace was slow and your language was slow and it was very calming in that situation. And it was interesting because even as she got more distressed, you stayed calm. So you did that really well. And actually, I don't usually use those things. <laughs> <laughs> That happens a lot, though. It does. She should be used to this because we have a lady that lives around the corner from her that would act twice as bad as you. And if her husband or boyfriend got hurt, she would be ramping up and down the hallways and out the door. And she mm -hmm. jabbers at six miles an hour or more, actually 50 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So you give her the right scenario. <laughs> well, it is, it is b very scary. And... The scariest part is not only that he's hurt, but if you take him away, who's going to be my safety person? And so what do you do if you come across a situation? What do you do with a person with dementia? I just stay with you until someone comes in. Yeah. That would be what we do. Okay. Who would come in? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the hardest part is having all strangers in the house and you take away the one person that is their safety net. So it is important to, to stay with them if you can and reassure the person. But they might want to go with him, too, to the hospital. <laughs> I maybe I did. I got mad at him. One, one too many sass and back, and I pushed him down the stairs. So. <laughs> okay. All right, one more person. Okay, that's okay. He's trying to get me in trouble. He's got handcuffs. Actually, I left those in the car. I know. Yeah. Should we just give it to him? I can talk. What's the best way to do it? Okay. Okay. Yeah, the two of you could come. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thought I'd take a nap during this. <laughs> it's my nap time. Okay. I've fallen on the floor, and the neighbor has found me and called 911, and I hurt myself. Is the neighbor still around? Well, yeah. He's right there. Right. <laughs> oh god oh my Hi. god my name's steve I'm i don't want to go to jail oh no i'm not going to take you to jail <laughs> i i don't want to go to jail my name's steve i'm with the police department i see that okay. oh my god are you okay all i did was fall i did not i am not going behind bars can you can you tell me how you fell <laughs> well i tripped okay is anything hurt well, of course it hurts. Can you, can you tell me what God. hurts? Well, it hurts right here where I landed. Okay. But then it hurts over here, is and my head hurts, too. Okay. Oh, my God, I got a headache. I, this is Ron. He's from the fire department. Fire. He, 
Oh, I know he looks kind of scary, but his nickname is Taz. But he's with <laughs> oh, the fire boy, department. Oh, boy. What are, the, what are people going to think? I'm on the ground, and my, 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 my head hurts. Oh, it hurts bad, hurts? but gosh, it's down here, too. I don't know what's wrong with me. Golly, it hurts. Oh, boy. Where exactly does it hurt? Here and here and here. Oh, okay. God, I can't What's stand your first it. Name? Would you get me a drink or something? Yeah, he's probably oh, got a flask, but I don't carry one of those. Oh, oh my What's God. What's your first name? It, it, it's Chris. Chris? Oh, my God, my head is killing me. Chris, I need to cut, I need to check a couple things out. Will you allow me to do that? Well, I don't know. Well, You're both good. checking it out? Nope, oh he's God. he's going to take notes while I check <laughs> oh things out. God, We're going to kind of wait terrible. for the ambulance. What you... Well, get something to put over me, because you are not checking me out and pulling my pants down. <laughs> I don't even know you two. We are on the same page there. <laughs> I don't know what page you're on, but I'm dying here. Get me some help. I need I need to check a couple things out. That's going to require well, me to call touch my you, okay? daughter. I am not going. I need a lawyer if he's going to take me somewhere. We're not taking you to jail. Oh God. We're here to help. I've been there before. I don't want to go back. Please. <laughs> Okay. Not afraid to go back to okay. prison, huh? Okay. All right. <laughs> Excellent job. Okay. Yeah. So, what do you think about that? How'd they do? <laughs> well, we have to have a little bit of fun, but. We'll put that on the flyer next time. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? How'd they do? Yes, and that's good. <laughs> well, and sometimes the badge and that sort of thing could scare people. So sometimes you might want to put it to the side or, or whatever. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. And I, I think you guys were great because you did get down on my level. If you were towering over me, that would really bother me a lot. And oftentimes, they don't know for sure where they're hurting. And it might, they might say it's their head and it's their... You mind if I touch the leg, see where I'm going to yeah. push you, tell me when it hurts. She probably would have made you buy her dinner, though. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> At least a drink. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> I wanted a drink, that's for sure. So, any other comments? I think uh, I, I, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, at Clark, uh, I remember one of our ladies, she, uh, the ambulance came, you know, two, two good looking guys and she was all excited and she looked at them and she says, whoopee, we're going out to dinner. <laughs> and they just sort of looked at her and didn't say anything and just kept wheeling her out. But I, I think she had a good sense of humor even though she was having chest pains, I think. But to, to just sort of go along with that humor instead of, they just ignored her. <laughs> and it was like, ah, have a little fun with her because she is having chest pain. She's, dis she's having some discomfort and obviously she's gonna go to the hospital. So have a, have a good time. The other thing sometimes, and I think uh, Joy mentioned this, is especially if you're picking someone up at a facility, uh, the people there know a little bit about their cognition and to ask, do the mini mental on them and ask them what year it is and what day it is just agitates them more. And I think if you can get the information from the staff right there, that's a good idea because you don't want them more irritated and, and feel dumb in front of people they don't know. So. And you have to remember, too, with people that are in a home like that, they may not know the day. Mm -hmm. They may not know the time. No. Routine is the routine of the home. You can't right. ask them a question that isn't related to their time. Yeah. Something that we would normally know. You don't want to ask them something else like, who is this friend of theirs? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that might help a little bit also. Yeah. yeah. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I think, oh, go ahead. Something that's not quite gelling to say, does she have problems with the bone? Mm -hmm. You know, that 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Some way find a way to access, and I have been in that situation, but a person um, was doing quite well mentally, but something didn't seem quite right. Mm -hmm. And the caregiver may not tell them. <coughs> so I don't know if it's appropriate in the situation where you're called in, but to really encourage people to look at getting a good workup done so they have a good sense of what the diagnosis is. The other thing is the tables around here, we've got, there's lots of services, which you're probably already aware of many of them, that, but there's like a matter of balance class. If you're working with somebody and they want to learn more, um, there are classes that are evidence-based classes that we implement here throughout Kent County um, and surrounding counties too. So there's lots of resources in our community to help people stay independent, to stay at home, to understand as much as possible about their medical situation um, so they can function as independently as possible. So Thanks, Suzanne. I was actually um, going to mention something else later, but I'll transition now. There is several brochures and other resources in your packets that you can take home with you. One of them is the Area Agency on Aging, which again is this agency here. And we serve, um, we have an information and assistance phone number. So if you call that main phone number on the Area Agency on Aging brochure, um, they will be able to answer any question for you regarding anything with an older adult. So even if it's not dementia, just something else where somebody's in their home, not in their home, but it's a person over 60, please just call our main phone number and um, we have an intake specialist who will be able to point you to some resources or be able to direct you in the right path on that, even if it's for a client or a patient or something else. We encourage you to use that phone number as well as the rest of the resources that are in there. I know that um, some of you are f not from around this area, like some of these here from Flint and maybe Traverse City, is that correct? No? Okay. Um, okay. I don't know how often you, you utilize the Area Agency on Aging or use it as a resource, but you can go on the web and put in Area Agency on Aging and it will pop up where, you know, which ones are, are local. Um, with the Alzheimer's Association, the 800 number that's on all of your information is a smart number. So that means that you can use it anywhere in the United States and it'll go directly to the closest Alzheimer's Association. So if you want to pass that number along, it doesn't make any difference where you are in the country actually, that that, um, that number would be applicable. And it's, it's a good number to call because if a family is having trouble during the night or doesn't know how to do something, it's 24, 24 hours seven. and it's so important to, especially yep. if they're frequent flyer with your services, they may need some other services to help them along, so. Yeah, it's 24 seven, yes. Ah, and nice. Like that. And she just was so proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that kids, you know, yeah, that's neat. Give her outlook on Maybe that. a little bit more accepting. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Well, we are about ready to wrap up here. Are there any other questions we can answer for you? Yeah, go ahead, sir. It's difficult, you know, for some of us to get our, our folks, our responders that we have, to show up to something like this, you know, even if it's in the evening or whatever, because for one, we don't want to deplete our staff, specifically for us being a paid on-call department. Um, <coughs> is this something that, a program like this, that we could get brought to our station, you know, to train our folks there and to, to get them up to speed? Because, like I said, we have, you know, numerous facilities in our response area. We cover 60 square miles. You know, we've got adult foster care homes, we've got memory care units, and I think it would be critical to get the people on our, on our department brought up to speed and, you know, more familiarized with this because, the patients, they actually deserve it, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. we've got to get that out there to everybody, and it's hard to, you know, with 26 of us, I can't send 25 guys into town to do this, even if it's only yeah. an hour and a half. So you're hoping that we can come and do a training specifically yeah, for another, yeah, absolutely. And, and invite other, you know, the surrounding departments in to 
coming. That way, you know, we can still cover our areas, but we can still get a lot more people through something like this. What do we think, ladies? <laughs> We are also taping it. Thank you for reminding me. Obviously, there's a video camera here. We will be taping it for those who cannot get a live presentation, but um, definitely communicate with me and we can see once who I can direct you to or how we could make that happen. Um, we That is our hope to be able to educate more people about this. So thank you for the question. On the script right here, they didn't want to do it. What's that? The script, you know, that, that uh, both presenters do. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. I understand. Try to work off of our memory as to what we covered today, right. which, yeah, we'll probably hit on the highlights, yeah. but not the story best picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for asking, though. Well, Appreciate I, it. I think that uh, I forget what I was going to say here. Uh, the reality is, right now, there's five million, and that's going to triple with us baby boomers. So there's going to be a lot more people that you're going to come across, or have in your own family, or experience in the community. And I think one of the reasons that we like to do this is because we want to give everyone quality of life even if they have dementia. And it's time that we all learn how to do this. It shouldn't just be you, it just shouldn't just be us. It needs to be all of us that, that really participate in, in making America friendly for these folks. They still want to have a good time. They still want to participate in life. But if we don't know how to communicate with them, it's going to be very hard. Anybody else? Yeah. You, you probably can't answer my question, but with this Medicare funding, every time I had my dad into the hospital, he's deceased now, they would, after he was in the hospital for a couple of days, which nursing home do you want to send him to? That was very frequent. I had a lot of arguments, and I said, no, he's going home. Well, is there a caretaker there? Yes, I'm home. He's going home. I mean, he, he had his um, gallbladder removed. Why does one need a nursing home after they've had their gallbladder removed? Yeah, lots of considerations. Thank you. Anybody else? Kind of a weird question, but uh, dementia being a very serious situation and recognizing that we, you know, spare no expense to the actors involved in our role play, uh, the presence of who have great senses of humor. Um, yeah. And humor hangs in there a long time. Long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I know someone in the end stage that still uses your, your humor, and she has one of the best, best sense of humors, but she can't do anything for herself, but she could still crack jokes. So. Yeah, one of my favorite <laughs> stories is a, a patient with quite severe dementia, and I had to go in and check her bottom, and I said, you know, can I check your bottom? She goes, you know, why do you want to do that? I go, well, it's my job. She goes, couldn't you get a better job than that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think um, humor also is a wonderful way to kind of break the tension on situations. And I know, you know, you were using it quite a bit. Um, we're trying to get Chris off the floor there. So, <laughs> but it does. It it's a way of of being serious but being not so serious at the same time, and it can it can break the tension on very difficult situations. Right. Yeah. Yep, be either hit or told. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much for coming today. I, you can all see that there's a green evaluation in your folder. If you could all please, please fill that out, and then I'll just ask you to drop them. Um, I'm going to just steal this corner of the table right here on your way out, if you wouldn't mind doing that for us. We appreciate any feedback that you have. Thank you so much. Again, contact us if we can be helpful at any time after this presentation.